Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the October 3rd meeting, October 3rd, 2018 meeting of the Thousand Oaks Council on Aging. Would everyone rise, please, and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> Thank you. And um, we're going to skip number three on the agenda. That was from last month. Let's go on to roll call. Number four on our agenda, please. Please say here present when I call your name. Chair Gorbach. Here. Vice Chair Allen. Here. Is absent. I'm sorry. <laughs> Vice Chair Allen is absent. I, and I'll use first names. Oh, okay. Commissioner Stephen Allen. Here. Commissioner <laughs> Belding. Here. Commissioner Burt is absent. Commissioner Gitt? Present. Commissioner Maria? Here. Commissioner Mortimer? Here. And Commissioner Posta? Here. Thank you. And thank you very much. Number five on our agenda is now time for public comment. Do we have anyone in the audience who would like to make a public comment? I have no cards. Okay. Hearing none, seeing none, we'll go on to number six on our agenda, liaison and agency reports. And 6A is a report from the Ventura County Area Agency on Aging, and I am going to provide that report today. I've spoken about the VCAAA before because I sit on the advisory committee, and this year um, Commissioner Gitt sits on the advisory committee also. Ventura County Area Agency on Aging provides a wide variety of services to individuals who are um, not only aging but disabled and also caregivers throughout Ventura County. But I received a press release just a couple days ago about a new initiative, and I'd like to read just a bit of that press release to you to be sure that you are all up to date on what is happening in, um, with the VCAAA in Ventura County. First of all, a couple of years ago, the VCAAA began an initiative called um, dementia-friendly Ventura County. And the purpose of that initiative was to bring both information and um, different activities to individuals throughout Ventura County to um, ensure that people are aware of the, um, the, the, the issue of not only dementia, but in particular Alzheimer's disease. Let me read just a bit of this press release to you. A new movement was introduced to Ventura County this summer as the Ventura County Area Agency on Aging, the Alzheimer's Association, and other partnering agencies rolled out dementia-friendly Ventura County to provide better service to local residents living with dementia and to their caregivers. Initial efforts are now targeting local businesses with a challenge to become dementia-friendly. Current efforts are geared toward having Ventura County businesses complete either an online or an in-person dementia-friendly at-work training to officially become dementia-friendly in Ventura County. Businesses that complete the required registration as well as the training will be certified as dementia-friendly and will receive a sticker and a poster to display at their place of business. If you own a business or work somewhere you think may be interested in becoming dementia-friendly, please call the, um, the Area Agency on Aging or look at their website. The website is vcaaa.org. That's v excuse me, vcaaa.org. Thank you. I'd now like to call on Commissioner Posta for um, agenda item 6B and 6C. Commissioner Posta. Uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> Patty Ham, the supervisor at the Gobel, couldn't be here today, so I will sub in for her. I uh, hope you all stopped by last Saturday for the uh, 50s sock hop that we had over there at the Gobel Center. We had hot dogs, hamburgers, milkshakes, along with a bunch of Fonzie wannabes flirting and dancing with poodle-skirted ladies. Brought back many fond memories. Much fun. We have another great party coming up on Saturday, October 13th at 5 o'clock, our Bratz and Beer Oktoberfest. Good food, good drinks, with dancing and singing. 
Tickets are still available at the Gobo front desk for 10 bucks. Bring your significant or insignificant other. I'm sure most of you out there know everything there is to know about Medicare supplemental medical insurance, co-pays, and so on. Wrong. Most of us don't. Free helps on the way. HICAP, which stands for Health Insurance Counseling and Advocacy Program, a real mouthful, will provide individual counseling at the one-stop shop at the Global Center on October 22nd, 29th, and November 5th and 19th. Stop by the Global anytime to obtain information on setting up an individual appointment time. For more information, if you would uh, care to call, call them at 805-477-7310. That's 805-477-7310. Uh, uh, and now we have uh, Julie Spivak, who's director of the Canelo Senior Volunteer Program. She'll give us an update on activities at the CSVP. Julie, take it away. Thanks, John. Uh, the 2019 Wellness Fest is coming up in January, on January 16th, and at the Global Adult Community Center from 9 a.m. until 1 p.m., if you are interested in being a vendor at this event, the event is focused on all aspects of wellness, including nutrition, medical care, senior services, and more. Pick up a sponsorship packet in the CSVP office today. We have something new we're excited about. The, there is going to be a Senior Fitness and Empowerment Day, and this will be taking place on Saturday, October 20th from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m., Join the reserve for a day of fitness. There will be exercise courses, speakers, food, cooking classes, games, and fun. This is a free event, and they will be taking donations at the door. All proceeds support the Caneo Senior Volunteer Program. RSVP by October 14th at the reserve at 805-492-2471. Are you interested in new volunteer opportunities with CSVP partner agencies? Read to succeed, volunteer tutors needed. Be a tutor for second and third graders at the Thousand Oaks Library and help improve their reading and writing skills. Fall session is 10 weeks from October through December. Also, the Walk to End Alzheimer's. The Alzheimer's Association is looking for volunteers to help with their Westlake Village Walk on Saturday, October 27th. Volunteers will help with participant check-in, as well as handing out flowers and t-shirts. The CSVP office has a ton of new volunteer opportunities, so um, come by and check it out or give us a call at the CSVP office at 805-381-2742. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julie. Let's go on now to commissioner reports, and I'd like to call on Commissioner Gitz to speak about emergency preparedness, and that's agenda item 7A, please. So um, it's been pretty warm lately, and uh, I think an El Nino is on the way. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration predicts a 70% chance of El Nino conditions for January, February, and March this year. Um, and you can see on the map here some of the red areas. Um, when El Ninos happen, they often, uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, no one can, of course, predict that an El Nino will occur in seven, will happen in Southern California, but uh, they certainly bring heavier snowfall to the Sierras and uh, there's a lot of chance of mudslides and heavy rains in Southern California. Um, so the questions are, are you prepared? Do you have an emergency plan? Next slide, please. Of course, if you don't have an emergency plan, you can take your chances. This is what happened in Camarillo Springs in 2014 after the fires denuded the hillsides. But uh, hopefully that won't happen here. Next slide, Francine. Uh, so... Key areas of concern outside your home, your roofs, do you have known leaks? Do you have stains on some of your interior ceilings? Is your roof clear of debris, pine needles, leaves, and other debris? Are your gutters clear? Um, 
If you answered any of these questions, uh, and yes, you have really two choices. Next slide, please, Francine. Um, one, you can take your chance to survive another winter season, or two, you can get your problems fixed now. Um, one of the things that is simple to do is put gutter screens on your gutters to keep the debris out so you don't have to clean them every year. Another thing is to check your drains outside your home. Um, try running a hose into the drain grates and see if the water backs up. Uh, most plumbers will come out and clear your drains for $79, but you don't want to wait until they're backed up and during a rainstorm because you won't get a plumber at that point. So it's really good to check them now. It's pretty simple just to stick a hose there. Mudslides uh, obviously can be a, a big problem. Uh, if you have bare hills outside your home, you might want to consider putting plastic sheeting around them, on them, or sandbags to divert mud and water flow. And you can get free sandbags and sand at most of the Ventura County fire stations. Um, also, if there are drain channels in the hills above your house, make sure they're clear or contact the city if they're on city property. Trees, do you have large trees that next to your house? Do heavy branches overhang your house? Have the trees been weakened by the drought? You really want to have those kinds of branches trimmed to be for a rainstorm. Um, but oak trees and landmark trees require a permit from the city, so you want to take care of that now. But get them trimmed now before the rain. And your car, when was the last time you changed your windshield wipers? Uh, if they're over three years old, it's time to replace. And if your tires have worn tread, uh, you really want to get them replaced because you'll face a loss of traction on wet roads. Planning, do you have a plan in case of flooding, contacting loved ones, agreed to cell phone numbers to call or a backup uh, landline number to call, um, agreed places to meet? Do you have basic emergency supplies at home in your car? Are key documents saw, stored off-site in a dry, safe place? Basic supplies um, are basically one gallon of water per day per person for at least three days. Uh, food, three days of non-perishable food, a battery-powered radio or a crank, cranked radio, flashlights, especially the LEDs, which uh, last pretty long, uh, first aid kits with instructions, essential prescription medicines, and probably two to three hundred dollars of cash. So, Also, you might want to consider a wrench or pliers to turn off utilities, blankets or sleeping bags, pet supplies uh, if you have pets, complete change of clothing, uh, chlorine bleach and eye droppers, and paper and pencil or pen. Basically, you want to stay dry and stay safe, so think about it now before the rains come. And as of this point, they're in Camarillo, so they're coming this afternoon. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner Gale. Those rains are getting close. Um, item 7B on our agenda is the education report, and I am going to be your education reporter this year. And this is my favorite topic, as you all know, to report on. And so throughout the year, I will be um, bringing you a variety of educational opportunities that older adults may be interested in. But to start this first report this year, I wanted to check in with you about a recent blog that I read online called Mythbuster, Too Old to Learn. Mythbuster. Charles Beatty earned his Ph.D. after completing a 48,000-word thesis on the reasons why elderly expats living in Spain returned to the United Kingdom. Beatty was 95 years old when he did this. Mary Fasano became the oldest Harvard grad at age 89. And then there's Wally Talberson, who first went to college at age 70 and has since gone on to earn a bachelor's degree and three master's degrees, the last at age 90. And he says, as long as you're learning, you're not too old. And then I want to share with you um, a personal experience. When I was teaching graduate school at Cal State Northridge a number of years ago, I was teaching a class in, um, in the counseling department about career counseling. 
and one of my students was in the class because it was required for her master's degree in counseling, and her goal was to become a marriage and family therapist, which requires 3,000 hours of field work after your master's degree is complete. And so she was in my class as part of her, um, as part of her graduate school training, and, and she was in her mid-70s. And so, you know, we, we talked about this in the class, and the, the question that all the younger students had is, whoa, you know, you still have 3,000 hours of practicum when you're done with this. I mean, that is daunting for anyone. And her answer was, you know, the years are going to pass anyway. I may as well do what I love. And this has always been a goal of mine. So hopefully at this point, she is a marriage and family therapist. But I thought, wow, you know, the time will pass anyway. What a great answer. Keep learning. And so another thing this article mentions is um, there's a discussion in here about how our brains age. I've always been really interested in the science behind um, behind brain science. And the traditional thinking was that brain connections developed at a quick pace throughout childhood, reaching an apex in the early 20s. Cognition reached a plateau around middle age and then began an inevitable decline. That was the old thinking. Scientists today know that that is absolutely false. The brain changes continuously throughout our lives. There's never a time when mental abilities simply hold steady. Instead, certain cognitive abilities weaken as we grow while others become stronger. Older brains may be just as adept at learning as younger ones, according to a study from Brown University. However, the more mature brains of older adult study participants used a different area of their brain for learning than younger counterparts. And this study contradicts a widely held belief that as we get older, our brains lose the flexibility to learn new tasks. That's false. That's called... Um, the, our, our brain's ability to adapt is called neuroplasticity, and there's a number of really, really interesting studies on neuroplasticity. You can Google that if you are interested. But I'd like to tell you about a couple of really cool learning opportunities for your brains coming up this month. And the first is a lecture that is going to be given at the Thousand Oaks Library, uh, the Grant Brimhall Library on Jantz Road, by, um, by author Michael Gorn. And his lecture is called Spacecraft, 100 Iconic Rockets, Shuttles, and Satellites that Pull Us Into Space. Um, Michael Dorn is a federal historian of 30 years. He spent 13 years at NASA. He's a Ventura County resident and the recipient of numerous awards and fellowships on aerospace writing. Go exercise your brain on um, October 11th. That's coming up really quick, 6.30 to 7.30. It's free at the Grant Brimhall Library. Secondly, another learning opportunity, again at the library, again free, coming up on October 25th, a Thursday from 5.30 until 7, is called An Introduction to eBooks and More. In this class, you will learn how to download and stream free, I said free, eBooks, e-audiobooks, e-magazines, e stands for electronic, e-newspapers, e-videos, through the website, through the library website. You need to bring your own mobile device and email address and password that you use to download apps along with your library card and PIN number. So the you know libraries have have changed so much since we were young. Oh my gosh, you know that used to be just a place to go check out books. Now you go and you can have access to all the information and entertainment and anything you want in the world electronically, but you have to know how to do it. Take this class, Introduction to eBooks, October 25th, Grant Brimhall Library. It's free, 5.30 till 7. Okay. And that concludes my report on education. I'd like now to call on Commissioner Maria for a report on social services, and that would be agenda item 7C. Thank you, Chair Gorbach. I just wanted to take a minute to make everybody aware of a fun little place to visit um, if you have some free time or you're trying to get away from that rain coming from Camarillo and you have an hour to spend. Um, it's called the Thousand Oaks Community Art Gallery. And you may or may not be aware of it. It's actually been opened in 1991. 
and it really hosts a wide range of art, different um, visual arts. They have exhibitions, they host workshops, and they have artist presentations. It's actually owned and operated by the city of Thousand Oaks. What they try to do is really showcase uh, professional and emerging artists and local artists, and they do, a, they do um, exhibit a wide array of art. So there's Im imagery, there's different techniques, there's different styles, it's paintings, it's sculptures. So there's really a wide variety of art that you can take advantage of. And it also offers original art for purchase if you're interested in decorating. You can really see, what I like about it is you can see fabulous works, of course, but it's both resident artists and emerging artists, and they're in our community. So it's a great way to just see, see and support our community artists. The other thing that they do, which I think is fabulous, is you can go to the website, and you can actually do a virtual art gallery visit. The website is toartgallery.org. That's T-O-A-R-T-G-A-L-L-E-R-Y.org. And you see local the local artist works online. And you also see um, neighboring community artists. Like you can visit the Agora Hills website or the Westlake website and do a virtual tour of the galleries that they have as well. Um, there are, if you're interested in art and want to want to spend some more time, there they do have volunteer opportunities. You can call Eamon McSweeney, and they can be reached at 805-381-7330. And that's a great way to stay involved in the community as well. If you want to go to the Thousand Oaks Community Art Gallery, it's easy to find. It's at 2301A Borchard Road, but it's basically right next to the Newbury Park Library, which is on the corner of Borchard and Michael. And um, the hours when they have an exhibition is 11 to 5, 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday through Sunday. Um, they do recommend that you call ahead and find out when the shows are open and what the, what the dates are for the current shows. You can reach the gallery at 805-498-4390. And I encourage everybody to stop by and visit. It's a fun little outing. And then make sure you head into the library when you're done. Great. Thank you very much. A really good report, Commissioner Maria. Now, that concludes our commissioner reports. I'd like to call on Commissioner Mortimer, who is going to introduce our guest speaker today. Thank you, Karen. Gregory Fontana, MD, is an international leader in cardiothoracic surgery, whose primary focus has been on less invasive approaches to the treatment of structural heart disease. Currently, he is the medical director for the Cardiovascular Institute of Los Robles Regional Medical Center. He previously served as Managing Director of the Heart and Vascular Institute and Chairman of the Department of Cardiothoracic Surgery at Lenox Hill Hospital in New York City, Vice Chairman of Surgery and Attending Cardiac Surgeon at Cedar sinai Medical Center's Heart Institute in Los Angeles, and as Clinical Professor of Surgery at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. Dr. Fontana has been a pioneer and principal investigator for several minimally invasive approaches in cardiac surgery involving transcatheter valve therapies and minimally invasive surgical procedures for congenital and acquired heart disease. As a widely, widely published researcher and author, Dr. Fontana's contributions to medical literature includes more than 150 academic citations, including articles, book chapter, chapters, and reviews. Please welcome Dr. Gregory Fontana. Well, thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so in the next two or three hours, I'll try to you know, keep it short um, <laughs> and cover a lot of topics, actually. Um, what we're going to talk about today um, is maybe one of the most fun things for me to do is just to uh, think about how exciting medicine is today in, in the world of cardiovascular medicine in particular and some things that are around the corner. Um, if I actually had a crystal ball, I probably would not be a heart surgeon. It probably would be needed a lot of other places, but I'm going to do my best at predicting the near future at least. So thanks again for uh, the invitation. So when, uh, when you think about, about uh, heart disease in general, we break it into different disciplines. And uh, roughly, uh, it's about coronary artery disease, of course, the most common killer uh, in not just the United States, but in all, all around the world still at this time, even in the developing countries. Uh, structural heart disease, so it's uh, the valves and the walls of the heart. Disease of the aorta. Uh, hypertension, 
a rhythm disturbance of the heart, and congestive heart failure. Sometimes these occur by themselves, sometimes they occur in combination. And so I'm just going to spend a little time on each one of these just to bring everybody up to date on where we are and what, where we might be going. But uh, I was uh, trained at Duke University where my professor said you need to always start with a little bit of history, frame the moment. And I think it's, uh, it's important as heart surgeons, to re if we always remember it, the early 50s when we first had uh, the early days of open heart surgery. But before we had machines, um, everybody was quite worried about creating a heart-lung machine. And the first open heart surgery was actually done here at the University of Minnesota. Um, and there's actually two patients in the room. One is the child on the table, which you can, you'll be able to see here on the left. And on the other side, you may see another patient uh, there or, or something in the background. That's actually the parent. Um, and so what happened was in, the, in these early surgeries, tubes were connected to the artery and vein of the parent in the groin went through a pump, and then went to the child, so the parent act, acted as the heart-lung machine. It's highly controversial. In fact, the professor uh, caught a lot of heat for this, and at one national meeting, somebody stood up and said, this is the first time in medical history that there's a potential 200% mortality. But amazingly enough, he did over 200 cases, and although not all of the children survived, all the parents did. And it was really an important advance um, that we started, uh, this was a time when we actually started to be able to work inside the heart, uh, stop the heart of the patient and work inside. And here's just a diagram. You can see the child on the one side and, and the um, tubes going over to the parent on the other. So that led to um, uh, a period where, where technology uh, was, as it was called, this was a from Life Magazine, 1959, Advances in Medicine. This is a heart-lung machine at Duke University Medical Center. Uh, it was made up of brewery equipment. Um, this is all blown glass. It took five gallons of blood to prime the pump and three days to clean it in between cases. So uh, just about 58 years ago, uh, not all of us, but many of us were alive uh, at, when, this was, uh, when this was going on, the early work. So it was quite a big deal at that time. At that time, most of what was being done uh, was congenital uh, heart surgery. We didn't have artificial valves yet and certainly didn't have bypass surgery. Well, the pumps got better and better, and here's a pump on the right from uh, our, our place now. Um, it's all computerized. Uh, there's all kinds of safety mechanisms that allow us to make sure the patient's temperature and acid base balance and blood count, et cetera, are all uh, in check. It's all uh, recorded automatically, and in fact, it's kind of like flying uh, an airplane on autopilot at some point in time. So it really optimizes the patient's experience on the heart-lung machine. And the one on the left was the first one. Uh, that was ever used on patients back uh, in Philadelphia in the 50s. So um, we've come a long way. We now prime the pump with around a third of a gallon, so compared to of, of fluid and not even blood. Uh, we just use the patient's own blood uh, and dilute it slightly when we go on the heart-lung machine. Well, most people think about heart surgeons, they think about bypass surgery because it's still the most common thing uh, heart surgeons do. And at the beginning of uh, the 60s, some um, early clinical experimental work uh, showed that if you go around the blocked artery, which occurs um, usually in the beginning of the artery, that you can bypass the lesion and provide blood flow to the heart in patients who are either having angina or actually having a heart attack. And uh, initially, we used veins from the leg. These, you probably know people who had their whole leg opened up and had the vein taken out. Now we take, uh, take that out with a scope through a little one-inch incision and or the wrist, or we take an artery off the back of the breastbone called the mammary artery. And in fact, right now, we, uh, we pretty much abandoned the veins from the legs because we found out that arteries last longer. So if things can't be fixed with angioplasty or medication, they get bypass surgery, they're getting arteries for the bypasses, which seem to be uh, last as long as the patient needs them. And the need for reoperation these days is, is very uncommon. The other major advance, which is I've spent most of my career, is uh, I think you all, most people think of heart surgery as the picture on the left, um, big incision down the middle and, and widely spread chest. But nowadays, uh, most of the things that we do, we can do through a small incision, uh, which we call minimally invasive heart surgery, uh, where the heart-lung machine is put in through the top of the leg, and then we work through a small port in the chest, uh, either under direct vision or using um, some amazing magnified uh, cameras uh, to give us 30 times uh, magnification of what we see inside. It really gives you the feeling that you've been dropped inside the patient because you're so... so um, you're uh, so much uh, in the field and immersed in the, um, in the screen. Well, um, it was about the 90s when angioplasty was uh, shown to be not very successful for blocked arteries because about 30% of the time the artery just went back to be narrow again. So stents, or fancy word for chicken wire that we put inside the heart, 
were just bare metal initially, and, and uh, they improved angioplasty substantially. But the, there was still about a 10% of the patients, these, these uh, stents didn't work if they were made of bare metal. And so over the last 20 years, uh, we've started coating the stents with medications that keep the stent open. It keeps the heart uh, arteries for, to grow through the stents and reocclude the vessel. And now we're actually working on stents that go in and do their job, and after a year or two, stent actually dissolves and leaves you with a normal artery again. So uh, kind of an internal way of treating blocked arteries that's getting better and better all the time. And uh, at this point in history, uh, stenting of the coronary arteries is more common than bypass surgery. So this continues to grow. The stents are getting better and better. And I think you know, most of the time, uh, we can treat patients successfully with stents and not have to have open heart surgery. But I think the most exciting thing about uh, coronary artery disease is the discovery a few years ago uh, of a community in the northern part of Italy called Limone Sulla Garda on the Lake Garda. And it was noticed that this community, a lovely, lovely place, had people who were all shapes and sizes, smoked, didn't smoke, exercised, uh, obese, not obese. And it was noted that this family of about 500 with the same genetic pool had no cardiovascular disease, zero. So even if they smoked, even if they were diabetic, even if they were slovenly and laid on the couch all day long, they didn't get into coronary disease. And it turns out that there is a hereditary circulating protein in this population um, that alters the way cholesterol is metabolized. So as you can imagine, um, there's just some sort of gene or, uh, machinery in their, in their genes that puts out a protein that tells cholesterol, you're not going into the wall of the artery, you're getting metabolized and, and removed from the circulation. And it was just amazing that such a diverse group of patients uh, was, was protected. So it was the first time we contemplated maybe we could have a vaccine, because if people don't have that gene and we give them the machinery with, through a vaccine to produce the proteins, then we might be able to prevent uh, for the first time ever uh, cardiovascular disease in the form of arteriosclerosis or atherosclerosis. And that not just be protective of the heart, but of course the brain, the kidneys, and, and uh, peripheral uh, vascular uh, structures as well. So I think it's pretty exciting. Uh, patients have now been treated with the protein. Uh, we started with, that was part of a trial where we were treating patients whose cholesterols were 1,200, 1,300, very, very high with familial hypercholesterolemias. And these patients had a very, very effective therapy. And there's now early work in vaccines. I, I believe that in the next generation, we were, are going to have a vaccine uh, for the treatment of arteriosclerosis, and, and it may be given in childhood. Uh, there's a lot of speculation that that's very, very doable in the next 20 years or so. Well, anyway, one thing, the other thing that's really helped us advance uh, to even less invasive procedures is the incredibly uh, spectacular advancement of um, imaging. And here's an imaging um, device we use that's basically a robot, and we can put the patient on a table and move them to any position, and the, and the robotic arm it keeps the uh, image uh, inside the patient in the same place no matter what we do so we can work through ports and have all the visualization we need on the screen. And if we need to move the table one way or another, we continue to see the patient um, in all, all the dimensions necessary. Um, we having these advanced uh, uh, imaging is now put into multiple screens um, onto one giant screen. So if we want to look at the arteries, the valves, and the EKG, and the blood pressure all at once, all the information is, is together. In a moment, I'll show you. We're actually now fusing the images so that we can merge different kites, types of x-ray and echo and CT scans into one image to give us exactly uh, the information we need without having to look at five screens and process it in our own brains. So we have a lot of this equipment now at uh, Los Robles Hospital. We have state-of-the-art rooms that allow us to, to do all kinds of very, very sophisticated uh, te uh, technological procedures, and I'm going to show you a couple of them in just a minute, and you'll see just why, if you can just remember why, uh, this, how this imaging will be helpful going forward. So after we're going to leave uh, coronary artery disease now and talk about structural heart disease. Um, the most uh, common structural problem we see in the elderly is something called aortic stenosis. Uh, it seems it's the last valve in your heart. It's called the aortic valve, and it seems if you live long enough and something else doesn't get you, this valve gets narrow, stiff, and can cause symptoms like congested heart failure, so shortness of breath, can cause chest pain, can cause fainting. And uh, it seems that if this, this valve, which has been opened and closed about several billion times by the time you get to be 80 or so, uh, you get stiff. And um, so there's nothing really you can do about it. There's nothing to prevent it. And so it has to be replaced. And historically, we had to do open heart surgery through the sternum, stop the heart, and sew in a new, new valve. 
Uh, but about 15 years ago or so, some early experiments were done. See if we could load a valve on a catheter and, and actually put it into the heart uh, while it's beating. So this is a cartoon. And the catheter you see that's coming up from below is, is coming around the arch of the aorta. It's coming through the, an artery at the top of the leg. And this catheter then can go across the narrow valve. It's uh, traveling along a wire, which is kind of like a rail, if you think about that, uh, to its destination. And we can open up the valve. The new valve pushes the old valve out of the way. The old valve holds the new valve in place. And we're able to test it before we let it go. It's, we don't like it. It's too high. It's too low. It, it doesn't just seem right. We can resheathe it and uh, reposition it. We're also looking at using an ultrasound from the esophagus, which is right behind the heart to make sure that we're in the best possible place and the valve is functioning optimally. So once we're happy with the, uh, with the position and the function, uh, we can release the valve. You can see here. And remove the delivery system. So the patients, um, we used to put the patients to sleep for this. We thought it was important since it was a big procedure. But now um, we've gotten so comfortable with this procedure and uh, know how to avoid problems that we just sedate folks. So they're awake, call it conscious sedation. So you're conscious, you're able to uh, speak to the doctors and the doctors speak to you, uh, but, but relax with some medication. So it's not quite an outpatient procedure yet, but... Um, most of our patients, about 60%, 70% are going home the next day. So that's a pretty big advance. The uh, FDA had us start with only inoperable patients and then high-risk high surgery and then intermediate-risk surgery, and we're now actually in uh, trials with essentially anybody uh, of any age who is, um, has aortic stenosis to be treated with this uh, technology. So it's very exciting, obviously, uh, especially in the uh, elderly and a more frail population who can be quite bright and, and active, but um, wouldn't tolerate open heart surgery very well, and the recovery would be very difficult. So it's been just a real blessing in that population. But uh, now we're treating patients much younger, and I think won't be long before um, this is an outpatient procedure. Okay, let's move on to the next topic. So that's the aortic valve, but um, we have other valves in our heart. The mitral valve is another uh, valve that seems to cause trouble in, the, in days uh, past, rheumatic heart disease was the most common thing we, we treated, but now we see uh, heart valve failure related to heart attacks and just a valve that, worn, that gets worn out, mitral valve prolapse. So now there's some technology that we're just about to start uh, here at Los Robles where we can replace the mitral valve um, on the beating heart. Can't go through the leg quite yet because it's a big device, but through a small incision in the side of the chest here, while the heart's beating, uh, we can deliver a mitral valve, put it into place. Again, look using ultrasound to uh, make sure that the valve is in the right position that's functioning well before we release it. And from one beat to the next, you go from having a leaky valve to having a brand new valve in place. Um, no heart-lung machine. Uh, the incision's about a two-inch incision on the side of the chest. And, uh, of course, we're starting with patients who are not good risk for heart surgery, um, high-risk patients, and uh, we think this is going to be a real, real advance as well. Um, the early trials with these valves has, have been spectacular, nothing short of spectacular, with over a 95% success rate and a very good survival. So um, that's two of the valves that we can replace now with a catheter system. And taking it a step further, <clears throat> a case I did this morning, actually, just down the road, something called MitraClip. And what the MitraClip is, is a way to repair the mitral valve. The heart is one of the most important organs in the body, working relentlessly to enable the human cardiovascular system to function. The heart has four chambers, the upper right and left atria, and the lower left and right ventricles. In a healthy heart, blood flows in one direction through the heart's chambers. Delicate tissue-like structures called valves function to ensure unidirectional blood flow within. The heart has four such valves, which regulate direction of the blood flow. The mitral valve separates the left atrium from the left ventricle and is made up of two thin flexible flaps called leaflets. When freshly oxygenated blood from the lungs returns to the heart, it enters the heart through the left atrium. Left atrium relaxation causes the mitral valve to open, enabling blood to travel into the left ventricle. When the left ventricle contracts, the mitral valve closes to prevent backflow. 
In some people, the mitral valve doesn't close tightly, causing mitral valve regurgitation. When the heart beats during contraction, the blood from the left ventricle can flow back up to the left atrium. Mitral regurgitation, MR, can be subdivided into functional and degenerative subtypes. Degenerative MR, or primary, results from anatomical abnormalities of the valve itself. In most cases, the cordae connecting the mitral valve to the papillary muscle rupture or elongate, causing leaflet prolapse. MR is a progressive disease which, if left untreated, can initiate a series of events culminating in heart failure and death. Current guidelines recommend surgical mitral valve repair or replacement in severe MR patients. For MR patients for whom surgery is not an option, minimally invasive procedures are available. MitraClip is a unique, highly maneuverable transcatheter system for mitral valve repair. This procedure avoids cardiopulmonary bypass using minimally invasive venous approach and transeptal puncture to gain access to the left atrium. MitraClip's steerable guide catheter is introduced over a previously placed guide wire. The dilator is used to gradually advance the guide into the left atrium and the guide wire and dilator removed. The clip delivery system is advanced into the left atrium, positioning the clip above the regurgitant jet and perpendicular to the mitral valve plane. Inside the left atrium, the clip arms are open to 180 degrees and positioned perpendicular to the line of coaptation before crossing into the left ventricle. The clip is advanced into the left ventricle below the valve leaflets and retracted to grasp the leaflets. MitraClip grippers are designed to drop firmly into the clip arms, securely capturing both leaflets. Once the arms are closed, they create a double orifice within the mitral valve. Prior to clip deployment, echocardiographic imaging is used to assess procedural efficiency and leaflet capture. Prior to deployment, the MitraClip can be released and repositioned for optimal MR reduction. Once achieved, the clip is released and the full system retracted. In most cases, the transeptal puncture reseals itself and tissue ingrowth between the clip arms increases, facilitated by the polyester clip covering, which promotes healing to create a fibrous tissue bridge between the leaflets. The MitraClip procedure is a minimally invasive, highly effective treatment option for select patients with severe MR. So I, could, I think you see there's a pattern now. We're moving away from open chest incisions to small incisions, from small incisions to being able to do many of the things we've required heart-lung machine uh, assistance to doing these procedures on a beating heart. Um, and I'm not going to go through all, all these others, but we have a number of devices in, in development that will allow us to really extend the reach of the kinds of repairs we can do on the mitral valve, and now also the, a valve called the tricuspid valve, the first valve. So. This morning, I operate on a lady who is uh, from here from the community, 90 years old, very active, still drives, shops, takes care of herself, very independent. And uh, we did a transcatheter aortic valve replacement a year ago. She did well with that, but we knew she had a leaky mitral valve. <clears throat> she kept coming to the office saying, Doc, I failed 10% better. I said, okay, that's not, that doesn't feel good. And uh, we kept watching it and watching it and realized that we had to fix the mitral valve. So this morning, we did the clip procedure on her. And, She's already uh, sitting in a chair um, waiting for her lunch about the time I left today. So remarkable for a 90-year-old to be able to uh, go through the procedure that quickly. And uh, the, of the patients we've done, we just started the program a few months ago. All of them have gone home the next day. Uh, another lady in the community, our first patient, who lived right down uh, the road here in, in one of the, uh, the senior retirement centers and uh, had been basically bound to her apartment for the last 18 months uh, and had been diagnosed with adult asthma at 88 years old, um, and, um, but knew she had some sort of a leaky valve and finally made her way to us. We thought her problem was her mitral valve and um, we fixed her mitral valve and a month later when she came to the office, she walked in the door, I didn't recognize her. She'd been to the beauty parlor, she had had her nails done, she was all, had been shopping and, and I, I had no idea who she was. She didn't look anything like she did a month before. So it was remarkable um, and she had been quite frail at that point, you can imagine not leaving her place for 18 months essentially and uh, so it's it's really a it's really 
changes people's lives and it changes it very quickly and safely. So aortic disease, uh, most people think of aortic aneurysm, you think about uh, the aorta swelling and big incisions, and especially in the chest, they can be particularly dangerous and uh, requiring opening uh, very, very long incisions. Um, and uh, the recovery from these are just, is just awful. Uh, and there's an incidence of paraplegia that goes along with it as well. And over the last few years, uh, we've developed um, ways to treat aneurysms from all the way from the top of your body to as you go down to the legs using catheters. Well, there's been a lot of work done for 20 years in the, in the abdomen, but once you get up towards the brain and the heart, obviously it's a whole different ballgame. But we now have some great devices that allow us to take care of very complicated aneurysms and di dissections of the aorta. Uh, again, with the heart beating, no heart-lung machine, no incisions, all working through the groin. And um, essentially, we can essentially replace the entire aorta now without surgery, um, depending on where the aneurysm or the dissections are. And again, these are generally either outpatient procedures or an overnight stay in the hospital. Um, hypertension uh, is probably one of the least interesting things we take care of because you know people don't, don't complain. It's a silent disease, a silent killer. Uh, but uh, they mostly complain about the medication uh, they take, and either it doesn't feel good, doesn't make them feel good, um, or they just don't like taking so many pills. And we've known for a long time that the kidneys control blood pressure um, in a substantial way. In fact, there are nerves that are around the arteries of the kidneys, um, the renal arteries, that talk to the brain, and the brain talks, uh, re returns the information to the body to say, well, let's tighten the blood vessels, let's relax them. We don't know exactly why uh, people have high blood pressure. 95% of people have high blood pressure for unknown reasons. About 5% have uh, tumors and other things that can cause elevated blood pressure. So um, a few years ago, some early studies looked at what happens if you go and ablate these nerves or kill the nerves uh, with either a hot source or a cold source and see if you can reduce the need for high blood pressure medication. Uh, the first couple studies were very promising, but they were treating extremely difficult patients, people who are on four or five medicines for their blood pressure. Uh, and we're now in trials now to move into intermediate um, levels of medication. And eventually, I think this will probably be uh, a routine procedure. It's already an outpatient procedure. Um, and basically, a, a catheter comes up from the leg artery uh, into the, the kidney arteries. And um, after about 30 minutes of positioning and doing this ablation, the tube, the catheter is removed and we're done. So this is back in trial again. And <clears throat> again, we'll be treating mostly very difficult to treat hypertensives, but I predict in the next uh, five to seven years, this will be a routine procedure uh, to treat patients with hypertension and the need for medication will be drastically reduced. Arrhythmias, um, there's uh, about two to three million people in this country that have atrial fibrillation, AFib, you hear that term or a lot. and uh, it's a difficult problem. The top part of the heart just kind of shakes and, sh and doesn't squeeze. Clots can form in the top chamber, especially in a little cul-de-sac called the left atrial appendage. And uh, it's dangerous, requires blood thinning and medications that can be somewhat toxic to keep the heart rate under control. Um, and in the past, there hasn't been really um, very effective ways to treat that other than medication. Ablation, again, killing tissue, just the right kind of tissue, the tissue that causes the atrial fibrillation has been treacherous because we're using x-rays and two dimensions on the screen, but we now have 3D imaging that allows the, uh, our electrophysiologists to go and map the top chambers, find out exactly where the problem is, and go and zap it with, uh, with uh, either hot energy or cold energy, and uh, basically just selectively kill a very small piece of heart muscle that's causing the trouble. And this is becoming safer, easier, faster, and we are really honored and uh, lucky to have the top uh, ablator in the United States, Dr. Andrea Natali, who comes here once a month for a week or so with us. Um, he's an old colleague of mine from, from Duke University, and um, we're trying to really grow our AFib program and our ablation program, and I think you'll hear a lot more of that in the next, uh, the next year or so as we recruit further, further faculty. Well, I mentioned the left atrial appendage, this little cul-de-sac that that's, uh, sticks out from the side of the top chamber of the heart, the left atrium. Uh, we don't know why we have it, it's, but it does form clot in atrial fibrillation. And some patients uh, can't take blood thinners or don't tolerate blood thinners, and, uh, or they, we can't get them made of atrial fibrillation. So there's now a way to go ahead and plug that hole um, with a little device so that the heart heals and there's no longer a cul-de-sac, and so clots won't form there. 95% of strokes that occur in atrial fibrillation come out of this little pocket in the top of the heart. So this is a procedure that Right now is an overnight stay in the hospital, probably be 
um, an outpatient procedure soon, and we just are have a, a commenced the program at Los Robles this, this month for left atrial appendage occlusion. Well, I mentioned earlier that imaging, uh, we couldn't do what we do without imaging. We can't, we don't have x-ray vision, and just a regular x-ray is not helpful. So we're using advanced 3 and 4D imaging uh, where you can basically fly, you know, into inner space. If you remember the old ride, Monsanto ride at Disneyland? It's exactly what it is. We can maneuver in and out of the heart, uh, across the valves and into the various chambers, uh, which allow us to measure, the, you know, the, the size of valves, to look at the valve function, to watch our device uh, be delivered as if we were looking at it um, uh, directly. It's a little bit like a cartoon, but it's uh, quite accurate. And now the uh, computer processing is so fast, it's all the images we see are in real time. So we basically take a CAT scan and scan the patient's body. Um, and then we can fill in the different chambers in three dimensions. We can plan the entire operation ahead of time, where we should make an incision, how do we access the valves exactly so we, don't, we cause as little damage to tissue that doesn't need to be damaged, and we get to our destination safely. Um, this is a procedure that I did uh, before I came to Los Robles, uh, where we were going to work through the tip of the heart, and we need, we need to know which rib we're going between, exactly where I could enter the heart with the needle and the catheter, and exactly where the destination was. So we did the whole procedure uh, ahead of time in the planning environment, in the simulation environment, and then these images are then put onto the screen in the lab, and we use the same exact imaging to, to complete the procedure. So moving on to congestive heart failure. Um, now this is a big one. Maybe 10 million people in the United States have heart failure. Um, I mean, there are many causes, but mostly it's caused by coronary artery disease and heart attacks. It is the number one Medicare diagnosis, um, the most common diagnosis submitted each year to Medicare. There are 5 million Americans at least living with advanced heart failure and probably closer to 10 with the milder forms of it, so just in the United States. And there's uh, over a half a million new cases per year. So a huge, huge healthcare challenge. It does affect all ages. I mean, children can have it as well with various types of heart muscle diseases and valve diseases. But predominantly, it's uh, over 60 years of age. And um, that's where we see most of the patients these days. The treatment um, has been to treat the underlying disease uh, use medications or some devices that we all show you in just a minute. Heart transplants, uh, we did 2,500 heart transplants in the United States last year. There's 5 to 10 million people in heart failure. Obviously, transplants aren't the solution. And then stem cells, and I'll address that a little bit later. I think one of the most exciting advances uh, that, uh, that we're seeing right now is the movement to something called left ventricular assist. Um, there's been such a push over the years for heart transplants. Again, we don't have enough for the, for the population. And then total artificial heart actually taking the heart out, but that sounds pretty scary what, you know, if the thing doesn't work. And it's, we've learned that if you can just assist uh, a weak heart with, say, three liters a minute of, out of a normal five liters a minute, most hearts get much better. And those devices were quite large initially, and now they're getting smaller and smaller and can be put in through a small incision. Uh, the one on the left requires a small incision over the tip of the heart and one up here, and that can replace the entire circulation um, about five to eight liters a minute if necessary. It does require a little cord to come out of the, out of the body, which is not, not very um, uh, appealing, and it can get infected, and, and it's also quite, uh, can be uncomfortable in some patients. But uh, as you can see in the middle, there's, there's some advances now with these mini pumps that uh, can be placed just below the clavicle and pump three liters a minute of blood in a failing heart. And like I said, most people, if the heart gets unloaded, it gets some help, it gets, a lot, it gets better. And um, this is about the size of a AA battery um, uh, right now. And uh, we're moving into a new generation of these. We should have them here in town, hopefully, within the year. Um, and I think for folks who fail medication, there's nothing else we can do. There's no bypass surgery, no valves to fix, but the muscle is weak, that this kind of thing will be uh, pretty common in the next five or five or seven years. So total artificial heart, this is the current uh, device that's, that's uh, available, as you can see. Take out the whole heart. You have a bunch of drive lines that come out. Very heavy device to carry around. I don't like it because, like I said, if the heart fail, if this thing fails, there's no there's no safety net. Um, it, it's over. And although it's been um, thought to be somewhat of a holy grail to replace the heart completely mechanically, I think most of us feel that the assist devices are really going to be the uh, the main support for the failing hearts in the future. There's some miniaturization, so to speak, of the total artificial heart. So it does continue to be advanced. This is a pal of mine from Texas Heart Institute. 
who's developed a, a very, very simple heart. That there are no pieces that touch inside each other. It's a magnet, and uh, basically it levitates and spins inside, so there can be immortal in terms of the mechanics of it. It should not wear out um, because there's no friction within within the device. All this does still require uh, a cord to come out of the of the body. There are really interesting experiments now to either uh, place a uh, an energy transfer system on the skin so that a battery can be outside the skin that transfers the, the energy to the inside of the skin to, the, to power the pump so there's no cords coming out. I think that'll be the next step. And then the final step is something here that's being looked at for pacemakers but might be for pumps later is to have your own body generate energy into a, a capacitor that stores the energy and you, your body motion actually uh, is used to, to drive the pump so that there's no batteries rest, uh, required at all. Way, way down the road a bit, but uh, for things that require a lot less energy, uh, these kind of mechanical actuators are, um, are in animal studies now, and I, th I think probably within the next 10 to 20 years, uh, getting away from drive lines and, and energy across the skin will be uh, generated totally internally. There's another one now that uses the diaphragm, so every time the diaphragm goes up and down, it generates, uh, it's kind of like you know water going through a, through a mill generate some energy and so kind of a self-sustaining system. Well, uh, lastly, with heart failure, stem cells, you know, uh, we've been hearing about stem cells for a long time. It's been very controversial, um, uh, especially if, uh, when you look at embryonic stem cells. Um, pretty much abandoned that at, at this point uh, because we found that all of us adults have our own stem cells um, that can be guided and guided properly. They can go help heal heart muscle, even brain tissue, we think. Um, it's been very difficult. Uh, the state of California was very generous and voted a few years ago to spend $3 billion over 10 years, as long as the science was done in the state, and that has completed, although there is now a continuing uh, program. Um, my, uh, one of my mentors said, stem cells show great promise, and they always will. Uh, that, you know, there's, so there's such, it's such a complicated mechanism that I, I think we still haven't seen the breakthrough science that will allow us um, to use this uh, routinely, but there continues to be a lot of funding, and, and again, another holy grail pathway is that if you have damaged heart muscle and you can get the, your own stem cells to go there and create uh, regenerated tissue that is exactly like you were born with, um, that that would be ideal. But I think, I don't, I don't see this on the early horizon uh, other than um, in science journals and in medical society reports. So I hope you feel like uh, we're, we're pretty excited about what we're doing these days. Uh, heart surgery in the morning, home by dinner, is really uh, a, a reality uh, that's coming. This, these are some colleagues of mine uh, from Montreal Heart, Heart, and that's the patient who had his transcatheter aortic valve in the morning. You can see it's 5 o'clock, and he's getting ready to go home. And uh, we're hoping that at Los Robles that within the next year, year and a half or so, we'll have an out, outpatient program for uh, some of these procedures that I've gone over today. So... The uh, future of cardiac medicine and cardiovascular surgery, um, I think we've pretty much covered that it's less invasive procedures, catheter procedures, using very small incisions when we can't do it with a catheter, advanced imaging and to assist us in our planning, but also to navigate through uh, the patients during the procedure. Angioplasty continues to be very important in coronary disease and probably going to absorbable stents so that body will be restored back to normal anatomy and physiology over a period of time. Uh, the automated arrhythmia procedures where um, three-dimensional and four-dimensional um, ablation is being performed super accurately uh, with great success, in particular for atrial fibrillation. Uh, totally closed uh, chest assist devices, whether it's at the top of the arm here or even inside the body, but it uh, won't be long before we can put three or four liters of assistance into patients who have um, no other way to treat their, uh, their heart failure. And then I think stem cells and vaccines um, really are the only pathway to cure, uh, so to speak. Um, I'm excited about the atherosclerosis pathway. Um, I'm not sure about the heart failure and heart, heart injury, heart muscle injury for stem cells, but um, either, either way, I think that, that, that's something that will be realized at some point in the future. So uh, people always ask me, uh, you know, do I love my job? And I love this quote by Walt Disney. He said, it's kind of fun to do the impossible. And uh, I would say that almost everything that I'm doing now, 25 years ago when I finished my training, uh, I don't think I could have visualized uh, wh wh how far we've come in, in my career and, and how far we'll probably go in the next five. So anyway, I appreciate your attention and I'm um, happy to entertain any questions if you may have them. Thank you. Thank you. 
I just wanted to say I saw your presentation at the Reagan Library in February, and I was so excited I wanted to get you here. So I was, I'm was i so happy that you finally came here <laughs> to you. present to us. So thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. And thank you very much, Doctor. Do we have any questions from the dais? I have one. I have uh, probably, okay. probably 30 questions, but I don't think we have enough time for it. A uh, couple of them are... Uh, do, does this valve or the aortic or the uh, uh, mitral have to be replaced periodically, uh, maybe for uh, for wearing out? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And secondly, yeah. is there an age limit? In other words, after a certain age, they say no, we got to go the old way rather than this new way. Yeah. So first question: um, How long do these valves last? Uh, we don't know for sure. Uh, the aortic valve, we have more experience. The first valves uh, that uh, went in that that are similar to what we're using today, about 10 years out. And we think they're 8 to 10 years before they start showing degeneration. doesn't mean they're ready to be replaced, but I tell people they're 10-year valves right now. Uh, the good news is that they've been designed so you can put another one inside. So if the valve, the aortic valve starts to get stiff again 10 years later, we can go back in the same way and open a new one. There's, they're so, they're, they, they require so little space once they're deployed. But you can put another one inside and doesn't doesn't cause any crowding and the valves work just fine. So I when I started doing these in 2006 at Cedars and um, starting to see a few of those folks back now. Um, and uh, originally we we're doing most people in their 80s and 90s, so um, they've gone, you know gone on to the next chapter for other reasons. But it wasn't from the valve. But some folks are around and they're and they're seeing some degeneration. But a few of them are alive and and it's still working fine. So it's hard to hard to know. It you know it's, there's some idiosyncratic relationship between artificial material in people's bodies, and some people degenerate them faster than others. We don't always. Maybe it's a low level immune response or, or something. The mitral valves were really just at the very beginning. We don't we don't know um, how durable they're going to be. Uh, the mitral valve is a much more complicated structure than the aortic valve, and the mitral valve closes when the heart is squeezing, so when it's pressurized. So the mitral valve sees your systolic blood pressure. If you're 150 over 90, it sees 150 mill uh, millimeters of mercury. When it closes, the mitral valve is holding the blood from going backwards into the lungs. The aortic valve is opened during systole, and then the high blood pressure is under no, is under no stress. So uh, we think the mitral valve probably, just like we've seen in surgical valves, will not last as long, but we don't know for sure because the, the materials we're using now are new and novel. Um, the repair techniques should have, um, should be, if, if selected properly, uh, they, they could be a permanent um, you know, fix of the valve. In fact, the first mitral clip, the clip case, um, they just came up on the, 15th anniversary, and the very first patient who was uh, treated in Caracas, Venezuela, um, they did a video on her, and she's has perfect mitral valve function 15 years out. So, it depends on on which one, uh, which procedure, and 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 why. Um, in terms of, there's no age limit in terms of a number. Of, we've done these transcatheter valves in in patients over 100 years old um, successfully, and I I think the only people I would not want to treat is are folks that are or have other conditions that really are going to limit their life uh, significantly. Uh, I do see patients who come with advanced dementia. I, I think that's just not the right thing to do to put them through a procedure when, they, when they're really not able to have the conversation with me. But that, it's really at the outer limits of, and even folks that don't have a long life that may have, um, or very symptomatic, if, they, if, they're going to have, if they have months or year, a year or two to live, we'll still treat them for just quality of life purposes at that point. Uh, can the uh, clip be used on the uh, aortic valve? Uh, no. Uh, so the aortic valve, most of the time, especially in the, in folks over 65, is narrow. And the problem isn't that it leaks, it's, it's that it won't open properly. But there are some people that have a leaky aortic valve, and we actually use the same valve um, for the narrow valves. We can expand that into leaky valves. But there's no way to, at least right now, to, to with a catheter, repair the aortic valve. We just have to replace it. Maybe okay. someday. All right, that's enough for now. Okay. okay thank you. Do we have any other questions? I have, I have questions? an email and my phone number if you, uh, thank you. you catch me up sometime. Okay, Commissioner Gitt. Um, which of these uh, are being done now at Las Robles? So we're doing the transcatheter aortic valve replacement, um, and we're doing the uh, mitral clip procedure. We're starting the mitral valve replacement procedure through the tip of the heart. So those three are all in play. We're part of a couple of clinical trials that allow us to do it in low-risk patients. If you're at a place that does it, but isn't part of the trial, you can only do it in the high-risk patients. But we have that available. 
Um, we are now doing, um, of course, the advanced ablation I mentioned. We don't aren't doing any of the mini pumps that are that are put in now for the more long term. We have some short term pumps we use for people who are very sick. Um, but pretty much anything that's out out there in the and available in the United States, we have access to, um, whether it's commercially available or it's part of an experimental protocol. And does Medicare pay for all of this? Indeed, everything that. Uh, Everything that we are using right now, Medicare, um, once it's FDA approved, it goes to CMS and they make a determination if they will cover uh, the device. Generally speaking, they cover the device and, and all the care around it. And what's not covered, uh, if it's under an experimental protocol, the, um, the company who produces it has to sponsor it financially. So uh, there's generally nothing more than a normal Medicare uh, billing. If they don't have a secondary, obviously they're on the hook for that. But if they have a Medicare, uh, primary and a, and a secondary insurance is all covered, 100%. So I agree with your summation. It's remarkable. <laughs> Thank you. Truly. Any other questions, Medes? And um, let's give Dr. Fantana another round of applause, please. Uh, thank thank you. you very much. Really, thank you very much. really interesting Appreciate presentation. It. Thank you very much, Doctor. Number nine on our agenda are commissioner comments. And let's start down um, at my right. My left, rather. Go ahead. Any commissioner comments down here? No. no. Okay. Anything? Um, as of last week, I just as of last week, I just became a certified ombudsman for Ventura County. Hey, okay. congratulations! I'm real excited to get started on that. That's great. Congratulations. Down at this end, Commissioner Gibb. Um, for those of you that went to the karaoke um, event on uh, Sunday, Sat Friday, Friday. <laughs> I want to commend Julie and her team for an outstanding event that uh, the first time they ever did it, it just went like clockwork and everybody had a great time and of course she raised a lot of money and uh, I just can't say enough of the job she did, so thank you. Any other comments here? Okay, Commissioner Belding. It was on. <laughs> anyway, to dovetail with Dr. Fontana's presentation in a, an entirely minor way, um, I wanted to say that the Senior Center, the Global Senior Center, will be doing uh, free tests for hypertension, and they will be doing free blood pressure in the back lobby on Tuesdays, every Tuesday from 9 to 11, and I think that's a, a well worth thing to consider if you have um, any kind of an issue or are concerned about an issue, or if your blood pressure rises just because you go into the doctor's office like mine does, it's kind of nice to go someplace else and when you're in a nice, calm situation and just uh, have your blood pressure taken. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. The only thing I would like to mention is that Commissioner Gitt and I are um, newly appointed uh, representatives from Ventura County to the California Senior Legislature. And we're going to be traveling to Sacramento November 1st for our um, inauguration, not inauguration, what do they call it? Whatever they call it, we're, that's what that's what we're having November first, and we're really I'm I'm really looking forward to it. You know, you talk about learning new things. I have never been involved in um, in this type of activity before, and I am so looking forward to learning all the ins and outs of legislation. Because from what I understand, that's what we're going to be working on is um, legislation to um, empower and assist in any way the older adults in the state of California. So really looking forward to that new experience. Our televised meeting is next coming up on Wednesday, November 7th, when we will have a guest speaker on everything you've always wanted to know about reverse mortgages. And I know there's going to be a lot of questions on that. So please join us here in the boardroom at the Civic Arts Plaza, or you can watch us on television or on your computer. And uh, with that, I will close today's meeting. Thank you very much.